Welcome, welcome. We have some great people on the line. I see that we have um, some faces that are familiar, some faces that are brand new. Um, so this is really cool. Go ahead. The chat is open as well. So feel free to, to open up the chat. Let us know where you're ca calling from, where you are from, and kind of even what, what the, the interest was for you to, to be joining us today. Um, I will do my best to save time at the very, very end uh, for some additional questions. Questions, Q and A, that type of thing. Um, and what you would like to do is just write your questions in the chat. I will try to address them as we go forward. Um, in the event that uh, we're running just a little bit long, which could be the case, uh, I will sp spend a little bit of time saving that for the very end. But welcome to getting an opener that helps to get you more meetings. Because one of the challenges that we have with a lot of people is that you know oftentimes we are writing out you know whether this is through email email introduction, social selling, um, even networking types of events. We're starting to see more networking events starting to allow themselves to be back in person and everything. And yet somehow, number one, we always seem to be a little caught off guard when somebody says, so tell me what you do. And then we're like, uh, uh, and it's like, here's the thing. This should not be a surprising question. This should not be something that feels like it has all of a sudden appeared out of nowhere. We should be able to just go ahead and address it accordingly. Number two, the other thing is, is that when we do, when somebody does says, tell me what you do, it's like, well, I do this. I help people do this. I, 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 and we'll talk about the problem with using an I statement when we are creating a great opener because it does not meet the intention of what an opener should do. We need to think about how do we move the process back? How do we uncover the layers and figure out what is the intention of this? What are we hoping we're going to get out of that conversation? And then from there, we can carry on. Um, sorry, and now my Zoom is, uh, is looking for my, um, uh, let's just take a look here. Um, okay, you're going to get some fancy things going on. I usually do virtual background. I didn't get a chance to, to test everything out here ahead of time. This is, um, this is rule number one of, uh, of, of poor setup today. But you know what? I'm on vacation this week, uh, so you're going to have to deal with it. <laughs> okay. That's the reality. Okay, so um, I'll tell you a little bit about my background. Um, in my background, my sales background, I worked for a lot of different companies, a lot of Fortune 500 um, type of companies. And what I what I learned from them was that number one, it didn't matter if we were working with a company that had had a, a, a background or not. But really, what it was was about you know ha ensuring that we were actually having. Um, sorry, give me just one second. Let me turn off this. Uh, oh, Zoom's not even going to work with me today. There we go preferences and we're going to turn off this virtual background here because this is going to bother bother me more than it bothers you uh, it gives me one second there we go okay so when I worked for these other different companies, what I noticed was, um, was despite the fact that the, oftentimes we were given some type of, of territory or anything, most of the time, even those territories that we were given, nobody had actually reached out to them in many years. Sometimes even in some cases, it was forever. When I worked for a company like Clarion, Clarion Medical um, Systems, what, we, what I was given was a territory that nobody had ever given. The company was nice enough to go ahead and filter out a bunch of accounts that I could go ahead and start to address but there was no no conversation that happened ahead of time now if you followed um, some of our other webinars in the past uh, just uh, we will sometimes talk about things like buyer persona and one of our very first recommendations at that point in time is to create a list of 100 create a list of 100 accounts, a list of 100 clients that you want to then go out and reach out to, that you want to create conversations with. Um, so this was kind of from a corporate standpoint, what they were essentially doing. They said, if this is what an entrepreneur or a small business owner has to do, now here is a list. We've kind of curated our own list. It may be weak, it may be strong. It doesn't really matter. Here, Kim, go out and start reaching out to them. Now, the, the problem with just getting a list is that what do you say? How do you start a conversation? And when I got to American Express, where now I was dealing with enterprise level accounts, big corporate accounts, the list was even smaller with the intentions that, you know, you would have to actually reach out to 10, 
20 people sometimes in a single account to get anywhere that you could actually have the conversation. This did not mean that we were always going to create the exact same opener, even within those same accounts. What I ended up feeling with every single one of those companies, despite the fact that now I'm getting into like, you know, one year, three years, five years, 10 years of sales experience. Every time I faced that brand new list, I felt anxiety. There was nervousness. There was fear. There was like, what do I say? How do I approach people? How do I get started with this conversation? So I, I tell you this because I know exactly what it feels like when we're starting either a brand new company, a brand new line of business, or we're just deciding that we're going to reach out to brand new people for the very first time. There is nervousness. And what we want you to do by the end of today's conversation is to feel a certain level of, huh, I can do this. And now I know how, and we're going to give you an opportunity at the very end to even work with our team to actually make that even stronger. So who is KO Advantage Group? KO Advantage Group, we, we, number one, we provide you relief. We provide you with relief knowing where your deals are going to come from. How nice would that be? Here it is, June 29th. How nice would it be in two days would be July 1st, knowing what you're going to close in the month of July today. How much more sleep would you get? How much more comfort would you have in whether it is investing, whether that's hiring employees, whether that's just managing and making payroll? Oh my goodness, I know what those deals are gonna come from. I know how much they are gonna be. Number two, it's gonna give you empowerment because we're not just building a business for the sake of just taking any clients, whoever will say yes, as long as they have a pulse and a credit card number. Oh, that is my ideal client. No, that is a terrible place to be. I sp speak from this from personal experience because I know what it was like to take on those terrible, terrible clients, the ones that you just said yes to because they were willing to pay. Ultimately, it actually led to terrible things in your business because you spent way too much time on them. They ended up demanding way too much and you could never really grow your business because we were so busy with the problem child that we could never actually work with the ones that would actually help us to grow and expand. Our company is really dedicated to the success of you. You as an entrepreneur, you as a small mid-sized business owner, specifically not just any business, but those in the consultative business to business sales. You are a business consultant. You are a marketing agency. You are an engineer, a project manager, an outsourced HR company. You are selling something invisible and why all else being equal is someone going to pay you five times, 10 times more in the market because of the service that you provide, we actually give you the process to be able to figure that out, to be able to work with your clients. Because here's the thing, sales is a process. That should already give you like a real sense of relief. Like, oh my goodness, she's so right. Like sales is a process and it is a process that allows you to become much more cash flow predictable. It allows you to figure out how to get those bigger sales and faster closes. And if you follow the steps in that process every single time, I promise you, you will be more successful and you will allow your business to grow faster than it has ever grown before. This is me today. So I started KO Advantage Group back in 2017. Um, I am LinkedIn's most influential sales leader to follow, Success Magazine's most inspirational blogger, Startup Canada's female entrepreneur. And I'm gonna give you an opportunity to download my third book, Sell More Faster, for completely free at the end of this. But let's talk about how do we create that open or how do we create that evolving conversation? Because most people get the, the mistake of that the opener is the same as a value proposition. Each statement, unique selling proposition, value proposition, um, opening, elevator pitch, like oftentimes people will think of those, those different terms as synonymous. They're all the same. I want to clarify to you that they are not the same. They are not synonymous because the value proposition of Evolved. At first, it evolved by, by being all about the seller. This was then. This is where a lot of people, unfortunately, have stayed. It's I have something that you want. Do you want what I have? Listen, I help people, you know, get new cars. You want a new car? I have cars for you. Come to Jim's used cars discount and and beaters, and we'll get you the car that you need. If you need a car, I have it. Right? I help people do this. I do this. I do this. Now. 
in about the late 90s, early 2000s, there was a model that came out called the Challenger model. And at the time, it spun sales on its head because Challenger wasn't about understanding that your prospect needs a product but that your prospect is in pain. It is because of this pain. It is because of the suffering that we feel every single day that we need a resolution to solve it. If you are in pain, I have something that will help you to relieve your pain. And this was revolutionary because for a long time, sellers didn't understand why somebody, all else being equal, would buy product A versus product B when they didn't even directly compete, right? We're not even talking about the same competition. And today this is more relevant than it ever has before because your your prospects are oftentimes buying products or services that may not be relevant to the same type of conversation. If I am an HR outsourcing company, my prospect may not be looking at other HR outsourcing companies unless they decide that that is what they need. But they might look at other ways of growing their business. They might say, okay, well, I'm going to compare HR outsourcing to marketing agency, to um, system administration, to a virtual assistant. There's going to be four different things that we're going to compare. Now they're not, they're not all talking to the same thing, but the pain that I'm suffering from is that I need to be more efficient. I need to communicate internally with my employees better. And each one of those things may do something a little bit different. And that is why as a business owner, I'm comparing those. Now, this was, this was really the model to go after up until technology, Google specifically really took over because the problem with just focusing on the pain is that Google solved the pain for a lot of our people. When Google changed from Boolean search, which was type a word plus minus whatever you wanted to, to when they changed it to ask me a question, this changed everything. Because all of a sudden we weren't just going ahead and writing uh, coffee, um, uh, coffee machines minus, you know, um, cafes. We were now actually saying, where is the closest coffee shop? And now this was the problem and Google could go ahead and solve it. Now, this is, this is no different whether we are talking about consumer purchasing products, processes or we're talking about in business to business processes. Now our clients are solving their own problems. So how we go ahead and we've evolved since then is now talking about our clients' goals. This is where you want to be. All else being equal, the problem that you have is not the problem that you're trying to solve, but rather that you deserve. You deserve to be somewhere better. Think of this from your own standpoint. What are your own goals? Are your personal goals to have more clients? Are they to have more uh, better closes? Are they to actually increase the average value of every single client, whatever what, um, that you have? What is the goal for your business? And how does that personally motivate you? As a business owner, I want to be personally motivated by having the very best clients that are gonna pay a premium price over a shorter period of time. Why is that personally motivating for me? Because that allows me to go ahead and have more freedom, more free time, more time to spend with my family, more time to be at my summer vacation cottage. Yes, I might be in the shed, but that allows me to work from anywhere, anytime. That allows me to have my goals. And you're no different than that. You have some type of personal goal that you want to have. And our clients are no different than that. So we have to ask ourselves, what is my prospect's goals? What are my goals? What are my prospect's goals? And how do we help them get there? Now, the relationship between the unique selling position, value proposition, and elevator pitch actually work hand in hand, but they are completely different. The unique selling position is really what makes you different. Uh, Jim Collins talked about this and from good to great, he called it the hedgehog, right? Um, there, were, there was other conversations um, in various different books, but this is really about like, you know, what makes you different? If you're writing your own, like you have to create a business plan, you typically one of the questions in the business plan is what makes you different? Why would somebody buy from you versus anybody else? And this is a valuable conversation to have because when we understand why people are wanting to buy from you, what makes you different? Now we can go ahead and start to target people that 
that are specifically looking for that unique process. Um, Seth Godin, and this is marketing, he talked about, you know, figuring out what your little matrix is. There is something that your clients want at, on a certain, uh, on two different axes. It might be low price, high quality. It might be high quality, extreme service. It might be more personal attention and, um, you know, better access to, to labels or something else like this, whatever that is, but there's two matrix in there. And whatever that is, you should be fit yourself in the top right corner. That is where you want to be. And those are the clients you want to go for. The value proposition position out of that ends up becoming now that you understand what makes you different who is that specific client that received that specific value from that oftentimes what we want to do is we want to cite some type of quantifiables this is dollars percentages or something else clients that work with me end up receiving 20 percent more in revenue clients that work with me end up having um employees onboarded and be having being able to pay them back in as little as four months from the from the cost of hiring and training people that work with me end up getting um you know faster turnaround of their service whatever it is there should be some type of quantifiable you should be able to figure it out because you can't measure it. It doesn't exist. And then out of that, then we were able to create an elevator pitch. And at the time, the elevator pitch had to be less than 20 seconds. The idea behind this was that if you got on to, into a lobby of, a, of an office building, you go ahead and you press the button on your floor up. And now you've gone ahead, you're pressing floor number 20. And as the doors of the elevator were about to close, somebody stuck their hand in there and said, whoa, 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 wait, 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 I need in. And the person jumped in and now... It's the CEO of the company that you're trying to sell for. They go ahead and they say, oh, you know, I'm on my way to the 20th floor too. Now you have approximately 20 seconds from the lobby of the elevator all the way up to the 20th floor to say something so powerful that as the person gets off at their floor, they say, you know what? let's have a meeting about this. I would love to, I would love to have some time in my calendar to spend with you. There had to be something so powerful. Now, what this is, is not necessarily, I'm going to throw a bunch of information at you, which is where a lot of people fail in their elevator pitches, but rather it should summarize the impact. Now today, 20 seconds is far too long, far, far too long, because we'll talk about that in a second as well. But we have to understand what is the intention of the opener. What are, what are we wanting to get out of the conversation that we are talking with someone about? If we don't understand what the intention is, I know I have succeeded in my elevator pitch because this is the result that I ended up getting then you have dramatically failed in this conversation. And this is where lots of people have failed themselves is because if I tell you, I deliver sales training to entrepreneurs and small businesses that are selling consultative services, you're like, okay, great. Now that I have this information, meh, what am I going to do with it? Whereas if the intention is to create a conversation, how do we know a conversation has been created? Because the person asks us a question or even better, has responded to a question that we have asked them, conversations are two way forms of communication. Now we know we have intended that. Now, he, the reality is, is thinking that your intention of your elevator pitch is, well, I want the person to ask me for a meeting. That is putting a lot of weight on the fact that you're going to be able to create something so compelling that the next thing that comes out of that person's mouth is gonna be like, how can we meet about this? That is more than likely not going to be the, the result of anything that we say until we get a little bit further down the line. So we have to start think about what is the next thing that we can do in part of that conversation. Asking a question will incite a response. Now we've created a conversation. Giving information is actually allowing a lot of hopes and dreams and chance that the person is going to be interested enough or have the uh, social capabilities to know what is the right question to ask. Asking questions is actually a very specific social skill that is gained over time. So if you want the other person to sigh, right? Oh, oh not this again. Oh, right. Start with an I. Start with, I do this. I help people do this. I help them. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, well, that's great. And now my eyes are jutting out and I'm looking for the next out. If you do not want to sigh, don't start with the I. 
because here's the thing it's not about you this is not narcissism this is not about let me tell you how amazing i am let me tell you how uh, like incredible i am now don't get me wrong there is value in certain types of expert statements but not in the opener not at the very beginning of a conversation nobody is so excited to go on that first date with somebody because they're like this person would not shut up about how amazing they were oh i can't wait to sit down for a first date with them that is not how we get started on in some type of romantic relationship and romantic relationships very much align to professional relationships so we want to make sure that we're engaging with the other person. The reason why so many elevator pitch sucks is because they all start with the I statement. Now, nobody cares. Nobody really cares what you do. What they care about is what you are going to do for me. How is this going to impact me? Why should I care? How is this going to help my business? The attention span is no longer 20 seconds. If you actually watch, uh, if you're on Facebook and you're watching like little advertising videos, even LinkedIn is starting to, to do more of this. Um, Twitter's doing this, but advertising videos are now most effective at seven seconds long. I want you to just take this whole, all like, and hold on to this piece of information for a second because the average goldfish has an attention span of eight seconds. And people today have an average attention span of seven seconds. That means in the process of probably less than 10 words, you have to create enough impact to get to your intention, which is a conversation back, which means I need some type of response. If I have already given you seven seconds and you still have another 13 minute and a half, two minutes of information that you have to give me, you have already lost me and I am no longer interested in watching this. If you don't believe me, watch what your attention span is when you are watching a YouTube video and the ads start to come up and the ones that force you to watch it, like you're already looking for something else. And the other ones, they'll give you about three seconds and you're already skipping them. There are the occasional ones that you're like, oh, I might give us a couple more seconds, see what else there has. This is how we want to focus ourselves. So in your opener, you really only want to focus on two things. If you are given seven seconds, seven seconds, I want you to focus on what do you want someone to feel? How do you want them to get emotionally charged by what it is you're saying? Do you want them to be excited? Do you want them to be fearful? Do you want them to be nervous? Do you want them to be skeptical? What is that feeling? that you want to incite inside of someone because your language is eventually going to help and stimulate that. But the second thing you want them to do is what do you want them to do with that information? Do you want them to think about their own business? Do you want them to ask you a question? Do you want them to consider how this is going to impact them further? What do they feel and what do they do? Those two things, if you can combine those two elements into a seven word, five word opener, now you are going to get more meetings. So what is the quickest way of doing this? The first thing is to think about what are you actually trying to do with your clients? And the way I want you to think about this is from an airline's perspective. When airlines try to sell you a vacation package or some other type of getaway, what they focus on is number one, that it sucks. It sucks to be where you are. The emotion that they are trying to incite, they actually try to incite two separate emotions. They try, by juxtaposing, by contrasting these two emotions. The first one they try to incite is that I want to be anywhere else but here. I do not want to be here anymore. And the second emotion that they try to incite inside of you is that oh, it would feel so much better to be somewhere else. I would feel so much more relaxed if instead of being in Chicago in the middle of winter, oh, I could be in Cancun and I could be so relaxed with the white sand and the ocean breeze. And what they want you to do is they then want you to explore where the next vacation destination is going to be. They get actually very specific. They show you specifically Cancun, but it's irrelevant whether you choose Cancun or Puerto Vallarta, Trinidad or Tobago or St. Lucia, they don't care. All they want you to know is that you want to be on a beach as quickly as possible. Now, for those of you that 
Yes, we heard this before. I want you to put yourselves on pause for a second. For everyone else, I want you to open up the chat and tell me what does the vacation, what does the airline sell? When they focus you on Chicago in the middle of winter and it sucks, oh, it is cold and it is flurrying, there is snow, it is terrible. And then they show you in the same place, but in Cancun, holding on to a Dos Equis beer, a Dos Cerveza, por favor, right? They're wanting you to be on the white sand beaches. What are they trying to sell you in that moment? I know that there's a little bit of a delay here, right? So I'm gonna give you a, a second here. What is, that, what is that airline trying to sell you? I have 20 people on the line. I can't believe I don't have anybody actually answering this. Right? Relaxation. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> Susan says relaxation, a dream, right? What does everyone else say? Maybe you've heard this one before. And if you've heard this one before, even say that, right? You know, they, I, I, I know exactly what it is. Um, they sell you on a feeling of enjoyment, right? You know, Jesse says, right? Camille says a dream. Lino says, oh, I already know this one. She's heard me do this one before. Absolutely. I'm happy to hear that. Okay. For most of you, what you've said is that it's going to be a dream. It's going to be relaxation. Now, here's the reality. Airlines don't sell dreams. What they have you believe that they sell is a dream. But what they actually sell you, what they literally sell you, is a seat rental on a plane. They don't even sell you the seat. They sell you a rental of a seat. You're going to be in this seat for approximately six hours. And if they focus their entire messaging on what it is that they do, we transport people at 30,000 feet in the air for anywhere between 45 minutes to over six hours and even beyond if you're wanting some international destination, come check us out because we can do it cheaper, faster, better than anyone else. Most people may not even consider the seat on a plane. Now, if they actually told you the entire experience of what that's like, plus not only that, we're going to jam pack you in a sardine can that's going to be flying for this amount of time with the recycled air. Most people are going to be like, get me out of here. Like, I actually don't even want to be on a plane. But they focus you on the feeling, the feeling they want you to have after you have experienced their product or service. After you have experienced their product or service, not during the experience. It is a subtle difference that will make a huge impact in the way you create your opening statement for people. Because what you have to ask yourself is what do clients ultimately get when they use your services? When they are finished your services, if you are a project base and they are now completely finished that product or service, or you are an ongoing relationship with a person. Perhaps think of yourself now that we have been working consistently for three months, six months, a year down the line, what do they ultimately gain from that? Is it increased revenue? Is it higher profitability? Is it better clients? Is it higher employee morale? Is it uh, lower cost of ownership of some specific area, which will then ultimately help them to increase in profitability, allow them to get more investments? There is something more, something more, something more. And as you think about what your product or service is, I want you to challenge yourself by asking yourself, well, so what? What else do they get? What does that mean? How does that continue to impact them? Continue to go down the path until you get to a point where there is no more for you to get to. Does that final thing that you have incited in your conversation, does that make you excited? Would this make your clients excited? Would this make them overjoyed? And if that's the case, then you know that that is the impact that you want to focus on in your value proposition statement. So the value proposition statement, what we want to do is we actually want to start off by going with something very large and then continue to shave it down until we get down to five sentences, five words or less. If we go ahead and try to just jam everything into a really short statement, we're going to miss out on the impact. And for most people, this is actually going to be way, way too difficult to get there. So let's think about what is everything that we want to say, and then how do we shave it down until we get down to the very specific, very crux of what it is that we want our clients to ultimately do. So we start off with that value proposition statement, and this allows people to become clear on what we do. It focuses on the solution. In the airline industry, the solution is the beach. 
The solution is not the airline flight. It is not the flight. A flight is not the solution. It is the means to get you to that vacation. The vacation is what we want the person to think. In HR outsourcing um, consultation, the solution is not helping you create employee policies and manuals and hiring and onboarding documents. That is not the solution. That is the product or service. The solution is ultimately to create better, um, more excited employees right from day one allowing them to become more profitable to your organization the longer they're at your company. That is the solution, more profitable employees. If you are an IT service provider, the, the solution is not the fact that you have you know, great LAN solutions, that you have um, unbelievable uh, safety and security when it comes to sending documents through cloud software. The solution is that your employees or sorry, your customers will feel secure when they're transmitting secure data, such as credit card statements and banking information to you, knowing that, they, that the possibility of you ever getting hacked is almost none. They can feel secure knowing that they can leave you with their most valuable information and it will not affect them. It will help to put the listener in the position of active position. So if I, let's say I am an HR outsourcing company, the, the conversation I have with a small, um, a, a very fast a growing startup where they're hiring like crazy will be a little bit different than a company such as a, like a Coca-Cola for instance, right? You know, where they are a very robust company and now they're going ahead and they're using maybe our services to help them start a brand new geography or something, right? You know, it's going to be a little bit different. A, a mature company is going to have a different impact for them than a fast growing company. And this might be the same in your own industries that you work with. Is your value proposition going to be slightly different depending on who you're talking to? That is a good thing. That is a really good thing. And we're not going to address it today, but in a few weeks time, when we talk about emails and we start talking about making phone calls and everything, this is how you're ultimately going to get even more meetings if you're not out in a necessarily a networking environment, but now where you're actually picking up the phone or you're addressing people. Um, but this is definitely going to help you whether you're using it in a wide variety of ways. The, the elevator pitch or the opener is going to fit inside these other elements of connecting with people. So your value proposition is going to put all of this together. It's going to start off with an optional who. Who is your ideal client? Um, in our buyer persona webinar, which I don't have the date for off the top of my head, um, if uh, I know that Dale and Mike are on the call, if you know what the date is for the specifically buyer persona, um, uh, uh, conversation, let people know. Otherwise, stay, stay in touch with us through our webinars, through LinkedIn, and you'll get notified with all of our upcoming webinars. And when you see a topic that resonates with you, join it. If you see a lot of topics that resonate with you, join them. I promise this will all put the entire sales process together. So you want to start off with who, who is that ideal client? And the narrow you can create your market, the bigger you are in your marketplace. Think of this like a farmer's market. If you had a giant booth that you're like, if I'm sitting here, people are going to notice that you are there. Versus if you set yourself up as a minnow in the giant ocean, nobody's going to even know that you exist. You want to find out who your ideal client is and get really narrow in this. This is actually an exercise that even internally as a company, we do this once a year. We, we think about who can we narrow down? Who can we narrow down? It's something that we should do consistently with every single company. Number two, what are they suffering from or the pain that they're suffering from? But Kim, earlier in this conversation, you said we actually don't want to be suffering on pain. I get it. But for most of us, we have an idea of what the pain is that we're going to start. We're going to start off with easy things and then we're going to build beyond that. So what is that pain that they're suffering from? Why they need your product or service. When they wake up and they say, oh, this needs to be solved in my company, what is that thing that is waking them up? Now, most of the time, I promise you, it is usually not specifically your product or service, but something greater than that. Oh, we're having employees that are complaining that they're not as happy. Oh, we're having um, our, our customers that are really concerned about data security. Oh, you know, if we're an accounting firm, right? We're having, uh, our customers are paying way too much in taxes and it's actually affecting their bottom line. What is that pain or suffering that they're, they're, they're suffering from? And number three, why? Why change now? 
if this doesn't change for their business, right, if they continue to have employees that are not as happy, if they're continuing to have um, customers that aren't joining because of data security, if they're continuing to have clients that are paying way too much in taxes, how is this ultimately going to cost your customer, your customer's business, not your business, I get it, we all want more clients, but your customer's business, why do they need to change this now? And then number four, how will their business ultimately improve? When that is changed, three months, six months after and down the road, how will this ultimately help them to improve? So I want you to think of it in this way. So I'm gonna give you two silly examples that you're gonna be able to apply. So in example number one, for the tired mother who wakes up at 3 a.m. When, when her baby is crying for a feeding, instead of waiting for the water to boil in order to warm the formula, costing her precious sleep, she will be able to heat up the bottle perfectly in less than 30 seconds and be back to her warm bed to get the rest she desperately needs. Who, what, why, and how? We were able to create this entire statement. Now, what we didn't say in here is what the product is that she's buying, right? This is probably some type of bottle warmer. This is probably some type of, um, you know, uh, created formula so that she can go ahead and feed her baby really quickly. It doesn't actually say in here and it's not relevant to say to. Silly example number two, this is probably going to appeal to a lot more of your businesses. As your company grew from one to 10 employees, so who are we looking for? We're looking for companies that have grown to a certain size, right? 10 employees or less. The number of applications you were using also grew to over 20 that are now doing redundant tasks, leading to moments when valuable files become lost. Reduce your search time when you integrate and use only the four most robust programs, allowing you to have consistency, efficiency, and more time to spend serving your clients instead of recreating files. Oh, doesn't that feel good? Like, isn't that what you would want? Now, what are we selling? Here's the thing. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what we're selling. We could be selling IT services. We could be selling a really cool ERP system. We could be selling some type of customized software. We could be selling some type of IT management or maybe some type of infrastructure consulting. I don't know, but it doesn't matter. It's not about the product or service. It's about how we're going to help you get there. If airlines only competed with the how, how are we going to help you get there? What they're going to miss out on is when things like Hyperloop and like fast trains, bullet trains, jetpacks, all sorts of different forms of um, transportation finally start taking off. They're going to miss out on that because they're going to be so busy talking about what their product or service actually is. Um, inside the KO Sales U course, we actually talk specifically around how Kodak made this mistake. Kodak, who was so focused on the film industry. Our clients biased because of film, because of film. And what ended up happening to them was that they became bankrupt because they re what they forgot to realize was that people were not buying because of film. They were buying because they wanted to share memories. Sharing memories was what actually Kodak was supposed to be selling, but they were so focused on what it was that they were selling that they forgot what it, the bigger picture was for their clients. So why don't we talk about the product? Because you are creating a solution for your customer. There's a, a very, it's a very crass saying, but there's a, a saying called there's 100 ways to skin a cat, right? The idea behind this is that whether we are going ahead and we are mopping a floor, we are using a vacuum, we are creating really good um, screens on windows. If the person has a problem of dusty floors, it doesn't matter what the solution is. Any one of those could have been the, the perfect fit for me. Yet where I'm, what I'm concerned about is what maybe meets my budget, what is going to last me for a really long time, what is going to be the ease of use, whatever is most specific to me. My problem is the dusty floors. There's a hundred different ways of solving for that. The solution for your client is oftentimes going to be, how do I get more profitability? How do I gain more revenue? How do I create better employee satisfaction? Something else like that. And this is why why a lot of a lot of companies will find themselves struggling because they don't realize what they're actually competing against is not companies that are doing the exact same thing but companies that are doing various different things ultimately helping that customer get to a greater result it is not about the product or service it is about what you will have when you are experiencing that product or service and as you create your value proposition, your who, how, what, and why, you can then go ahead. It's going to be a very long statement. In some cases, it's going to be two sentences, four sentences long. Go with what Mark Twain says. 
And he says, had I had more time, I would have written you a shorter letter. This is not a one and done thing. This is something that is going to take you a little bit of time to craft and work with and use your resources, use your tribe to practice this. Go ahead, talk to other entrepreneurs, other business owners who are just going to be there to help you get very successful with this and allow them to give you some advice, help you to, to narrow this down. This is not a solo job for you. This is something that as business owners, we are here to help you with. And we will help to give you more advice on how to create that shorter and shorter lever, le letter. So that you go from two minutes to 30 seconds to seven seconds to something that will make me cry. And now I know that I have to buy. So your elevator pitch, when you start to take your entire value proposition, that long statement, go ahead and start um, crafting that down. And then you can absolutely use this in a wide variety of different ways. Your elevator pitch does not only have to be used in networking opportunities. It can actually be used at the beginning of your emails, your phone calls, and other marketing materials. Why we focus on the elevator pitch before we focus on emails and phone calls because if you can get this part right the hook the compelling event whatever it is boom that is going to help to get you more meetings it should be said quickly now i say within 20 seconds but your challenge is to do this in even less than seven seconds and that doesn't mean because you are saying it incredibly fast okay we do not want this to be said incredibly fast unless like generating excitement through that tonality is what you're trying to create but rather that people understand and they get the point in a very short period of time it should not mention your product or service. If I hear what it is you do, I, I help companies understand their HR outsourcing initiatives. I help companies uh, go ahead and create better IT services for themselves. You've lost me. Because for a lot of companies, they really don't care what you do. They want to know what you're going to do for me. And can you take that value proposition and shorten it or engage with it? So a great book that you could possibly even read on this is actually by Daniel Pink, Dan Pink. He wrote a book called To Sell as Human. I think it's probably, it's going to be almost 10 years now. Uh, you know, but what he did, it was one, it's one of the best books in sales that I've read actually in a really long time. And this is coming from a sales expert, uh, besides mine, of course. Uh, but he, it is a great book. I highly recommend. But if you don't have the time to read it, um, go ahead, find him on YouTube. He has like some quick little snippets of videos on there. Um, here's, the, here's the quick Coles note is that he talked about how the elevator pitch has evolved and that it's not just the statement that we throw out at people anymore. The one that I, I very much encourage you to get to is turning your entire elevator pitch into asking a question. If you can turn your elevator pitch into a single question, now you've created a hook. Now you have ultimately got yourself to a point where what is the intention of the pitch? to create a conversation, to create some type of give and back. This is like a game of ping pong. I pass it to you, you pass it back. I pass it to you, you pass it back. If I throw you a bunch of information, I say, here, here is a bundle of stuff. You might not know what to do with it. And you're like, okay, well, this either looks like a make work project or I'm not really sure. That doesn't really sound like it's for me. And we walk away. Whereas a question forces the person to respond. And we can do this in a wide variety of different ways. We can either ask us as an open-ended or a closed-ended question. So questions such as, are you better off today than you were four years ago? This was actually Ronald Reagan's question that he used when he was actually going for his presidential election. G everyone was very happy with Jimmy Carter, right? Things were good. Ah, things were good. But Ronald Reagan came back and he says, listen, but are you better off than you were four years ago? And people in general, we want to be constantly growing and expanding. We want to be achieving brand new goals. We want to be achieving something more, something more. And so by, under, by asking this very rhetorical question, there doesn't need to be a response. But what it did was it incited a, a conversation in our head. We said, we should be better off. We, we should be, if we're going to be high, like if we're going to be electing a president again, we should constantly be better off. And this is um, when, when scientists, uh, political pundits and social science, uh, sorry, not social scientists, um, political scientists review this. They say that this was actually the question that stimulated and changed the entire election. Now, 
If you're selling a service, right, you could ask something along the lines of how you know when the right time is to hire HR services. How do you know when your security is failing your company? How do you know if you're paying way too much in corporate taxes? Oh, I don't know, right? How much less could you be paying in corporate taxes? Oh, I, I have no idea, right? Those are, converse, those are questions that we can use to help gather and gain from our clients. Rhyming. Rhyming is a fantastic one. And I highly recommend that you actually even choose a few of these and see if you can, you can craft a different elevator pitch using different ones. The rhyming being actually one of the most powerful ones, specifically for the stickiness that it has in someone's brain. When things like trade shows start to take over again, when we start to get into much larger um, you know, interactions, if you're being invited to a, a networking event for the very first time, brand new room, maybe you're in one of those situations where you stand up at the table, everyone says, you know, we're gonna go around the table and you're gonna tell us what you do, come up with a rhyme, okay? It may seem silly, it may in in involve people to laugh, but here's the thing, people remember rhymes. And not only do we remember rhymes, but human nature also says that if it rhymes, it somehow rings more true. Johnny Cochran did this when it was the O.J. Simpson trial. He says, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit. That was part of his closing statement. And instead of going on to a huge line about how if you have any sense of fear, uncertainty, or doubt, if there's, if there's an element of doubt in your mind that you should acquit, uh, acquit, the, uh, acquit O.J. Simpson, instead of going to that, what he said was that if it doesn't fit, you must acquit. If, 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 for, if that's enough of a doubt, then you must vote for acquittal. And people remembered that and they used that. And ultimately, O.J. was acquitted of murder trial. Takes the licking and keeps on ticking. Now, most people are thinking about this, like, what, what company is that? It's a watch company. What comp it's Timex. Now, if I want to talk to you about longevity, Timex created this statement back in the 1950s. And the last time they used it was the 80s. And yet here we are, like 40 years later, and people still relate it to Timex. This is how powerful a rhyme can be for your business. You can also do it in one word. Now, if you really want to be the power of like, you know, the six second elevator per person, think about how you can create a statement in a single word. MasterCard owned this with the word priceless. For everything else, you know, there's MasterCard, right? Memories are priceless. For everything else, there's MasterCard. Priceless. And they went on to the priceless experiences as priceless, priceless, priceless. And you're like, oh, MasterCard. Search. We automatically, almost every single person has already thought they saw the word search. Why do we think of search? Because when Google goes ahead and shows you their Google bar, all they say is search. And the, when um, in the early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s, when uh, search engines were coming around and you had options, right? We, we still have options, but we don't really have options. But we used to have options and we used to go to Yahoo or Ask Jeeves or, um, you know, there was, uh, there was a whole bunch, AOL, there's a whole bunch of different search engines that you could choose and you would choose whichever one is your favorite. And Google went ahead and all they had was a white screen that just said search. And the user study that originally came down, they would actually sit at this white screen and they would sit there. And after about five minutes, the researchers came up to them and said, well, what are you waiting for? And they said, we're waiting for the rest of the page to load. And this was funny because at the time there was all these banner ads and there was so much information that people were like being inundated. And Google said, let's just make it as simple as possible. Let's just tell people what we want them to do. They have to do one thing. What do we want them to do? We want them just to search. And instead of just looking at all these banner ads and, you know, information and everything, all we want them to do, we have to do them one thing, search. We want to make it feel easy, simple, search. What do they feel? What do you want them to do? Email subject lines. This is where we can really start to use our elevator pitch to create more meetings because your email subject line should drive curiosity. It should talk about the benefit and be very specific. It, as specific as it is, I do not want you to think that your email subject line has to be all encompassing for everyone, but rather that if anyone else got that email, are they as likely to open it? And the, if the answer is no, they wouldn't be as likely to open it, then you know you're actually on the right path. 
because email subject line should be very specific to the person that we're wanting to get there. Um, examples of this would be things like three simple ways to get more email subscribers. I would be specifically high, targeting people that were trying to get more email subscribers. If I felt like I had enough email subscribers, I probably wouldn't look at this. Three simple ways is like, yeah, is there something that I could possibly do to do that, right? But now I need to open it. I need to figure out what are those simple ways, right? I won't know those until I open the email. The best formula to lose 10 pounds in 30 days. Very specific, 10 pounds in 30 days. I'm not talking about, you know, lose any amount of poundage that you will possibly want to, right? Uh, we can work with you for a wide variety of times. This is 10 pounds in 30 days. And it doesn't matter if I want to lose five pounds in 15 days or 20 pounds in 60 days. Perhaps I have a, like, you know, an upcoming event, right? And I need to just be able to fit into the dress that I want. Very specific. Twitter. I love Twitter and I love Twitter for a wide variety of reasons. Now Twitter allows you to write 280 characters, um, but the challenge here is to do it in 140 characters or less. It forces you to be concise with it. Now, the other thing that I love about Twitter is that you can actually get a lot of information in a very short period of time. And I said a bonus of done in haiku. Haiku is the Japanese poem that goes from five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables. And the reason is because it has a nice sing song to it. When Apple released iPod, they were not the first MP3 player on the market, but what they did say it was a thousand songs in your pocket. It created a tangibility for what two gigabytes of data created. Two gigabytes of data is meaningless to people. They do not understand what that looks like. Whereas a thousand songs in my pocket, I get what that is. And they actually showed that by showing an entire CD collection. And they're like, you can have all of these CDs in this little one inch by one inch piece. And people are like, wow, this was incredible, right? The same song, get to where you're going, someone else is driving you cheaper than a cab. You can hear the sing song in it. And, and what that does, it just creates a calmness for it, right? If I was using Uber or Lyft or one of those other ride sharing programs, I'd be like, oh yeah, I already feel calmer by hearing the sing song accordingly. So your challenge, your challenge for yourself is to create an opener in five words or less. Can you do it? And if you need help with this, I actually encourage you to come to us for help with this because we're experts at this and we're happy to help you and we'll give you an opportunity to do that. How else can you use your elevator pitch? Well, how about your LinkedIn tagline? LinkedIn's constantly asking you to create a tagline. Why don't you test it out? See if it sticks, see if it resonates with people. Are you creating um, blog posts and content? See if you can use it for your blog posts. Maybe it's on your website. Maybe you put it in your, your business cards. Try it out in an email signature line, networking, introductions, social media, and all sorts of different types of things, right? Whether that is going to be to use it eventually for phone calls, emails, or other high value outbound connection points. We're here to help you go through that entire sales process. But at the end of the day, application is always greater than the education. I have taught you a lot about how to create that powerful opener. How are you going to use this in your everyday life? I want you to, if you've started to create this or as you create this throughout the week, I want you to connect with me, write something on, on LinkedIn, put a post and be like, I just attended this amazing webinar. I'm like, here's my new, you know, um, elevator pitch. Here's the new, like, what do you think of this? See how much engagement that you're getting with it. If you're going to use it to connect with people through phone calls or emails, connect with me. Let me know that it has been effective or maybe that it hasn't. And if it hasn't, then let us help you create something even more effective. People that have seen us and used our sales process and actions have told us everything from, I feel like you really undervalued the, the class and the program that you've created. Nabil was struggling, struggled every single month to get a deal. And he found himself, he's like, Kim, when you said that the ideal client was somebody with a pulse and a credit card, He's like, you are speaking to me. He's like, I knew that that was what, like what I was, I was constantly just chasing anybody that had money. And he goes, and by the end of the course, he's like, I had more business coming at me than I ever had before. Rob Crooks was in the same position. He said that he, he was, he believed in the fallacy that it would take two years to turn his business profitable. And he says, you know, and finally he got to a point, he actually had twins. He had twin kids and he says, you know, he's like, at that point now, I knew that if I wanted to be the father that was going to be there for my children, I had to do something. 
And he goes, and this was revenue that it was just sitting there and was just waiting on. And Doug said that he was able to close a six figure deal and the client countered by paying more. He says, Doug, not, not only are we interested in what you've proposed to us, but are you also able to do this other piece that you've talked about? And we would even pay you more for that. He's like, I was beside myself. He's like, Kim, a deal like that in the past, he's like, I don't even think I would have ever gotten something like that. He's like, but that would have taken me easily like two, three years. And he goes, and this was like overnight. And Cameron said that this was like magic or something. Magic. Okay. So here's how we're going to help you get more meetings. We're going to help you get more meetings today. Today. If you go to bit.ly slash KO meeting, what you're going to see is you're going to, you're going to be able to book a time with either myself, with Dale or Mike, right? It will just show up to whomever, whoever is available at your time and choosing. Um, you're going to get clarity on your message. So if you just need help on what you've learned today, how do I help to turn this into that, that Mark Twain quote? get create a shorter letter in less time make more connections with prospects maybe you need more leads maybe you need to be able to close the deals that you already have or how do you get your deals ready to close in 30 days if on june 29th today you are feeling like more than 80 percent unsure that you have no idea what is going to close in july if you are feeling that fear and that anxiety right now you need to book some time with us we're going to just work with you for 30 minutes. There is no charge for this time. We are genuinely here to help you because if we can't help you in this 30 minutes, it doesn't matter what other value that we could have possibly provided. I promise though, that no matter what you are going to get something out of it. And if you decide that you want to become a formal student of us, we have, we are completely reasonable and fair when it comes to our structure and our pricing for all of our programs, whether that is a self-study program, whether that is an instructor led program, or that's working with one of us on a one-on-one -on -one basis. If you are not ready to go ahead and even just talk with us, which I don't see why that would ever be a case. I want you to download my book for free. And if you go to bit.ly slash sell more faster book, you can actually download the entire ebook at no charge, the entire thing, because I want to give you the most relevant information that you can get in order to help you build your business the absolute fastest right now. Now you are now all official K unofficial KO sales, you students, and we end every single class, every single webinar with this type of question. What is one thing you took away from today? What is one thing that you are going to do today? What is one thing that you are going to take action on today? Application is greater than education. Remember that. And I need you to go do something, whether that is writing a great LinkedIn post and saying, you know what? I just want people to know how amazing this was. I want to actually apply this information. I'm going to download the book. I'm going to try this out on some new clients and prospects all the way through. And why do we do this? Because you can have everything you want in life if you help enough people get what they want. LinkedIn calls me their most influential sales leader to follow. Zig Ziglar is my most influential sales leader to follow. And I know that you had options on what you could do today. And I am honored and grateful that you chose to spend the last hour with me and my team learning how to create better openers. I hope this, this information was valuable. Go ahead, put something in the chat. Um, don't forget if you, we have a couple minutes here left. Um, I have two minutes, so I have time for one, maybe two questions uh, going forward. Thank you. Thank you all so much again. Uh, you're welcome, Natalie. I'm so glad that, uh, that you enjoyed it. We're hosting, uh, we're actually doing an entire summer of webinars. Um, I asked my team, how, how else can we help entrepreneurs and small business owners? And Mike on my team says, we need to be doing webinars every single week. So join us. Um, today's the last Monday that we're going to be doing them. We're actually going to be moving them to webinar Wednesdays every Wednesday for the entire summer. Uh, it will be me or one of the other members on my team, Dale or Mike, giving more great information for you. So join us for, for as many as you possibly can throughout the entire summer. And I promise, I promise you are going to get more deals and more conversations happening with clients than you ever have before. Um, thank you, Susan. I very much appreciate it. Thank you, Camille. Uh, yes, work on getting that in a form of question and then let me know how that goes. Tell me if it is powerful and you're able to get more meetings out of that. Uh, thank you.
Thank you all so much. You have a absolute fantastic Monday morning, wherever you may be, whether you are at home, whether you're at your summer uh, cottage uh, shed on the, in the woods, in the mountains. Next time, I'm going to have to make sure I change my view so you can actually see what I get to look at right now, which are these fantastic mountains. Um, that's absolutely beautiful. Thank you, Mark. I very much appreciate it. Yes, I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad. Hal, thank you very much. Uh, put the blink. Yes, absolutely. Um, here is uh, bit.ly slash KO meeting is how you can go ahead and get, the, oh, sorry. Let me try that again. Bit.ly slash KO meeting. Um, and then the book is bit.ly slash sell more faster. Um, if you book the meeting, you'll automatically be prompted to also download the book as well. So uh, you can get two, two birds with one stone on that. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a great, great day.